And uh, Dr. Gleb is an internationally renowned thought leader in future proofing. He specializes in helping forward looking leaders secure their organization's future by forecasting and addressing threats and maximizing opportunities. He serves the CEO of the Future Proofing Consultancy Disaster Avoidance Experts. A best selling author of several traditionally published books, Dr. Gleb is most well known for his 2019 bestseller, Never Go With Your Gut How Pioneering Leaders Make the Best Decisions and Avoid Business Disasters. It's published by Career Press. And his 2020 best selling book, The Blind Spots Between Us How to Overcome Unconscious Cognitive Bias and build better relationships. And that's published by New Harbinger. His groundbreaking thought leadership was featured in over 550 articles and 450 interviews in prominent venues. They include USA Today, Time, Fast Company, CBS News, Fortune, Inc. Magazine, CNBC, and many more. Dr. Gleb's expertise comes from over 20 years of consulting, coaching, and training. His clients include innovative startups, major nonprofits, Fortune 500 companies ranging from Aflac to Xerox. And his expertise also comes from his research background as a behavioral scientist with 15 years in academia, including seven as a professor at Ohio State University. In his free time, he makes sure to spend abundant quality time with his wife to avoid his personal life turning into a disaster. Uh, <laughs> To help you take advantage of his groundbreaking expertise, I've asked him to share with us about defeating unconscious bias via the neuroscience of emotional and social intelligence. Please welcome Dr. Gleb. Take it away. Thank you so much, Steve. I really appreciate that kind of introduction. All right, everyone. So let's talk about how you as quality professionals can address unconscious bias. Let's talk about what unconscious bias is, first of all, just so we're all on the same page. Unconscious bias has to do with decision making around people. It's about bad decisions we make around people, where we unconsciously, without realizing it, have a bias in some direction or other, either a positive bias or a negative bias that causes us to make problematic direction decisions around people, where we favor them too much or don't favor them enough. That's Called discrimination or we favor them too much you know that's also discrimination in another way and also quite problematic so unconscious bias is what we don't want but that's something that we all suffer from when you look at the research on unconscious biases when you look at the research on how we make bad decisions around people i bet the large majority of you found yourself making some bad decisions around people and that has to do a lot of those bad decisions where you realize after the fact that, hey, I made a bad decision about this person, it has to do with those unconscious thought processes and feeling processes, mental processes that determine our decision-making. So that's what we'll be talking about. The first part of this presentation, we'll be talking about what are the specific unconscious biases that we suffer from as human beings just because of how our brain is wired and then the second part of the presentation, we'll talk about how to address them. So that's the structure of the presentation. That's what you can look forward to. Now, the first thing I want to talk about is how we make our decisions in general. We're told to be confident, and that's an important quality. That's an important characteristic, to be confident about your decision-making as a quality professional. You have experience, you've been trained in this field, You know, some of you have been in this field, for decades, some of you might be fresher to this field. But in any case, you got certification, you got training as a quality professional. So you have experience in your area of work and you can feel confident in that. And as part of that, there's that overlap of confidence with how you make decisions around people in your work. But before talking about people decision-making, let me talk about something outside of work. Something that we also should be, have some confidence in our decision-making, namely our driving. So driving is an important ability, right? For uh, And it's something that a large majority of us have experience with. And I want to ask you, think about your driving skills, your experience with it, and think about whether you consider yourself an above average driver or a below average driver. Are you in the top half of all drivers or the bottom half? You'll see a poll on the screen right now. And the poll asks, when evaluating your own driving skills, 
would you say you're in the top half or the bottom half of all drivers? So please describe yourself, top half or bottom half of all drivers. See about one third of you voted. Let's get those numbers up. Make sure everyone has a chance to make their voice heard. I'll give you five more seconds to vote if you haven't yet. Some folks don't haven't done this before and they don't know exactly how to do it. So give folks a little bit more time with the first poll. Okay, I see three quarters of you made your voice. Oh, good, one more. <laughs> so four fifths now made their voice heard. Let's end the polling. So how many of us are in the top half and how many of us are in the bottom half? We'll see that 85% of us are in the top half and only 15% of us are in the bottom half of all drivers. And that's interesting because by definition, we should be on um, half of us should be on the top half and half of us should be in the bottom half. This overweighting of the top half has to do with our confidence. And we tend to be way too confident for our own good in all areas of life. I gave an example of driving because that's a very non-work related topic. And the same sort of confidence, higher confidence go, comes over into our workplace. And it has to do with a cognitive bias, a dangerous judgment error, unconscious bias called the overconfidence bias. It's, we have a tendency to be way too confident. This question does, one of the ways that we know that people have a tendency to be confident is research. And so the question that they asked you about the top half or bottom half of all drivers, area above average driver, below average, was asked of college freshmen. And they were asked that, and guess what? 92% of them described themselves as above average drivers, of the top half of all drivers. Now they have much less experience than you, but that's how they perceive themselves. And that happens in all sorts of areas. So for example, there was a study done on doctors and doctors were asked, uh, well, okay, this one was done on lawyers. I'll give you two studies. One was done on lawyers and lawyers were asked, how many of you are in the top half of your profession and how many of you are in the bottom half? Do you think you're above average lawyer or below average lawyer? And so you'll see over 90% of them call themselves above average lawyers. The same studies were repeated done on professors and other professionals. And of course they found the similar results. So that's a big, big problem. There's an interesting tendency when you look at studies of confidence, when you're hundred percent confident that something is high quality, right? It's quality professional that a process goes really well, whatever it is that you're hundred percent confident about something people are only right 80% of the time on average. So that's what studies indicate. No wonder Las Vegas makes so much money, right? So this is a problem that we tend to be too confident for our own good. And it's especially dangerous for people with more expertise, more experience, more authority. The more experience and authority you have, the more overconfident people tend to be. So for example, there was a study on doctors. And the study showed that what it did was it gave case studies to junior doctors just out of medical school and senior doctors, those with many, many decades of experience, decades of experience. And so it asked them to diagnose the case and what, what's the situation go and what would you recommend as treatment? And when you see, when you compare what they said to the right answer, you'll see that they got the right answer at about the same rate just new doctors, newly minted doctors, and those who've been in the field for a very long time. But the senior doctors were much more confident about the response, which is a problem, of course. But they were much more confident, but they were right at the same rate. Now, why is that? Why were they right at the same rate? Well, because people who were more junior had more fresh education. They just got their degree, they had fresher knowledge, whereas, of course, senior doctors had a lot of experience and know-how. And the same applies to all sorts of fields. People who are junior have fresher knowledge because of more education, more information, whereas senior people have more experience and know-how and senior people tend to be more overconfident 
than the junior people, even though they don't always get the question right at a higher rate than junior people as the doctors. So this is a problem. And this is something we need to realize is going on. And that is an aspect of unconscious bias where we make bad decisions about other people, about other people without realizing it and overconfident in our decisions. So that's the first thing I want to talk about. Now, this all comes from how we're wired, how our brain works, how we feelings work, how our, our emotions and intuitions work. We're told to make decisions about people and other areas with our gut. You know, gurus like Malcolm Gladwell tell us to blink, make our decision in the blink of an eye. Or Tony Robbins tells us to be primal, be savage, go with your gut, follow your heart, trust your intuition, all of that sort of stuff. It feels very good. Trusting a gut feels comfortable by definition, right? It feels counterintuitive to not trust our gut. It goes against our intuition. It makes us feel uncomfortable. It makes us feel very comfortable to go with what we feel, to trust our feelings and then follow that. Unfortunately, trusting your gut often leads to disasters in the modern world. Just because our gut, our intuition, our emotions are not evolved for the modern world, they're evolved for the ancient savannah. Now, in your work as quality professionals, you've been trained to make good decisions around quality. And those are not something that comes from the ancient savannah. So there's definitely experience and expertise you have in that field. But we're not trained to make good decisions around people. Our decision-making around people overwhelmingly comes from our emotions, our feelings, our intuitions. And that comes from what's called tribalism. A fundamental challenge with our decision-making around people is tribalism. We evolved for a tribal environment, for living in small tribes of 15, to 15 people to 150 people, as hunters, gatherers, herders. That's what we evolved for. That's what our intuitions and our emotions are for. That's a major cause of unconscious bias because what, what's tribalism? Well, tribalism is where you want to look you feel like you should value, trust, care for, and make better evaluations of people who look like you, who share your values, who share your cultural background, who share everything that you share, basically. And by the extension, you should feel hostile toward people who are part of the other tribe people who are opposed to your tribe, people who are opposed to your cultural values, who look different from you in significant ways, who sound different from you, and so on. That is, is something that was really important in the Savannah environment. If we weren't sufficiently tribal, we'd be kicked out of our tribe and we'd die. And if we were not sufficiently hostile to other tribes, then our tribe would get taken over by nearby tribes and we'd die as well. You notice, with the descendants of those who didn't die. That is something that you need to realize is going on within our intuitions, within our gut reactions of how we evolve and how we respond to people, how we respond to others. So given that, there are a number of dangerous judgment errors that call, uh, there's the specific ways that our brain makes mistakes around decision-making, around people and other issues. But we're focusing on people right now. And these dangerous judgment errors in all life areas, business, professional, personal, whether around people or not around people, are called cognitive biases. You might have heard the term cognitive biases. That's the, what the, this is about. It's the errors our brain makes because of how it's wired, because of its evolutionary background. That's what they are. So. I want to ask you now to check out another poll. So you'll see a poll. And I want to ask you, did the following ever happen to you? You made a bad decision. And looking back, you realized you had the information needed to make a better decision. So you had all the information you needed to make a better decision, but you actually made a bad decision. Is that something that ever happened to you? Please go ahead and vote. Okay, see that most folks voted. I'll give you five more seconds. Uh, 
Okay, yeah, good. 88% of you voted, that's excellent, Be better than before. So we see that overwhelmingly to over nine tenths of you, this is something that happened. You made a bad decision and you had the information that you needed to make a better decision, but you didn't make that good decision. And that's because of cognitive biases overwhelmingly. When we have the information to make the right decision, but we make the wrong decision, that's coming from these problematic mental patterns in our mind called cognitive biases. Now let's talk about some examples of these. And before we talk about a specific example, I'll answer a question that many of you might have been thinking about, might have been feeling like you would like to ask me something that came to your mind once I started talking, not when I appeared on the screen, I look like a normal, whatever, white American male, but once I started speaking, you probably heard an accent. So many of you might be wondering, where am I from? <laughs> I'll be happy to answer. I'm from a small country in Eastern Europe called Moldova. It's so tiny that you needed an arrow on the map to point out what it is. It's a very small landlocked country. I was born in 1981, so 40 years old, and my parents traveled from that country, emigrated from it in 1991 when the it was freed from Russian slash Soviet domination. And so then they traveled to New York City and that's where I grew up. So New York City is home for me. And I chose to keep my accent, the, even though many people who went to other parts of the United States dropped their accent. So you'll see a lot of people who go to less culturally diverse parts of the United States try to fit in, many immigrants chose to drop their accents or worked hard in dropping their accents. And you can do that when you're a kid, it's, it's especially easy when you're 10. But I grew up in New York City, it's a cultural metropolis and my parents taught me to be proud of my cultural heritage. And so I chose to keep my accent. Now, when I was actually getting a degree, a PhD, doctorate degree in behavioral science, I learned that I made a bad decision. Unfortunately, I didn't have the information to make a better decision, but I made a bad decision when I was a kid and when I chose to keep my accent because of something called accent discrimination, accent discrimination. So there's extensive studies showing that people with foreign accents and people with some regional accents in the United States are falsely perceived as being less trustworthy than people with a mainstream average American accent. So especially foreigners are perceived as less trustworthy when you have this accent like I do. There's only one foreign accent to which this really doesn't apply and that's the British accent. So they still have that cultural imperialism going for them. But otherwise, folks like me and others who have a foreign sounding accent are perceived as less trustworthy falsely. And that, of course, stems from tribalism, where it's an indicator that I'm not part of the tribe that, of mainstream American tribe. And it's indicator that I'm someone different, I'm from a different tribe. And that's just one example of a characteristic that speaks to what's called the horns effect. There are two cognitive biases here that you need to learn about when, to, when that correspond to bad decision-making about people the horns effect and the halo effect. The horns effect, it's pretty simple. It's when somebody's perceived to have little horns. If you dislike one characteristic, like somebody's accent, somebody's skin color, somebody's religion, somebody's politics, somebody's values, somebody's position in your firm, you'll have too negative view of their other characteristics. And the halo effect is the opposite. It refers to somebody having a little halo on their head. So when you like one characteristic of someone, you'll tend to have too positive view of all of their other characteristics. And it's especially dangerous for business relationships of all sorts. That might apply to relationships within a company. So for example, within, think of yourself as quality managers. When I consult for to companies to address issues between quality management, between quality folks, I often find them butting heads with operations folks. So people in operations, who just want to get the work done, who want to get the product done, who want to put out their whatever they're doing, 
ranging from you know engineer ranging from material products manufacturing to software code or whatever it is they want to produce things and they don't want to be held up by quality processes whereas you quality professionals want to make sure that the production is good that it's high quality and that corners aren't being cut so there's a constant tension within companies where that happens and what i've seen very often is that quality professionals have a halo effect toward other control folks, quality professionals, risk management professionals, etc. There's a positive relationship. This, you're part of your that tribe. Of course, the quality dynamic, the, the quality team is part of, it's an all internal tribe, but there's an alliance with the risk management tribe and you know, operate and other sort of similar control functions. Whereas there's a horns effect toward people on operations and related fields, R&D and so on. I've often seen that. So that's a horns effect where there's constant tensions within a company around this and where people on operations, of course, have a halo effect. So you hear teamwork being praised as a great thing within companies. Well, it can go both ways. Teamwork, when it applies to rooting for your own team, and opposing the other team within a company, that can create some serious problems. Now, I've, like I said, I've consulted a number of issues to resolve these sorts of problems around the halo effect and the horns effect. And I've seen it be prob quite problematic for quality management professionals. And of course, that applies to all sorts of other areas. For example, hiring. So not only within companies, but externally, when you're trying to hire someone. I'll give you an interesting example. I was giving a presentation on addressing unconscious bias at a closing keynote of the Diversity Inclusion Conference right here in Columbus, Ohio, where I'm based. This is home for me, Columbus, Ohio. And if you know anything about Columbus, you might know that it's the home of the Ohio State Buckeyes, one of the best college football teams. And it's our big rival is the University of Michigan Wolverines, so up north. And this is the one of the biggest, if not the biggest rivalries in college football. People here in Columbus, Ohio are very much fans of the Buckeyes and very much opposed to the Wolverines. So I'll give you, I'll show you an interesting video that came from that, con that conference that I gave, a closing keynote. And you should be able to see my screen. And let me share the sound so you'll be able to hear the sound. And what's happening here is that I'm giving this presentation at this, it was in 2018, so this closing keynote to the group of, of HR professionals at a diverse inclusion conference that are over a, a hundred HR leaders in the room who are specifically interested in diversity inclusion, experts in diversity inclusion. And I'm asking them, these Columbus, Ohio based HR professionals, whether they would hire a University of Michigan fan. So would they hire somebody who's a fan of the University of Michigan, so a Wolverines fan? So as you know, I'm a professor at Ohio State. I'm contractually obligated to root for the Buckeyes. <laughs> I'm guessing there are a lot of Buckeyes fans here, you know. Go Bucks, right? Yo, oh, there you go. Now, how likely are you to hire a Michigan fan? See, free people. Now. Regardless of how we feel about Michigan fans and their poor, poor choices <laughs> in which team to root for, does that indicate anything about their performance as an employee? No, I know. Come on, that no should be stronger. <laughs> All right, so as you saw, over 100 people in the room only three people, HR professionals who are experts and interested in diversity inclusion would hire a University of Michigan fan. So only three people would hire a University of Michigan fan. Three people. I gave them a chance to change their minds, as you saw, and they wouldn't change their minds. They would, did not want to hire a Michigan fan. And this tells you, you know, you're rooting for a team. This is about sports. This isn't about you know, something that's important to their livelihoods, like work relationships. This is about sports, something they're passionate about, but, you know, kind of, you know, doesn't matter too much. And uh, they would still make bad decisions around that. Of course, it doesn't matter whether somebody's a fan of Michigan or Ohio State, whether 
what how they perform. So this is a big problem. The halo effect and the horns effect are a big problem when you're dealing with people outside your company and when you're dealing with the people inside your company. Given that, I want to ask you, with what about your experience? Do you think it would be valuable for you and your team to investigate and address any negative impacts from the halo effect or the horns effect? Is that something that you think would be helpful for you? So over half of you voted, let's get some more votes. I'll give you five seconds to make your voice heard. I already know how to vote. If you haven't yet before, five more, a couple of more seconds. All right. So this is an overwhelming result. So all of you think that it would be important and valuable to address that. So I'm glad to hear that. Now that you have this information about the optim about the halo effect and the horns effect, you'll be able to take the next steps to identify these problems in your company and address them. And to address them, I'll give you some resources after the presentation to those who want these re those resources. I'll send them after the presentation for how do you actually address these problems, as well as talking about them during the presentation itself. Now, let's go on and talk about another pair of cognitive biases that's important to understand in terms of unconscious bias, how we are somewhat biased toward other people. And this is the optimism bias and the pessimism bias. So we talk about appearance often when we talk about unconscious bias, discrimination, racism, sexism, and so on. But we don't often talk about cognitive diversity, how our personalities are different and how we make different decisions and how we make different judgments around others based on how we think. And that is something that we greatly underestimate when we make decisions about people. So optimism bias, it's kind of like it sounds. It's people who are very optimistic about the future. I am one of these people. I tend to be very optimistic about the future. I'm very creative. I'm very entrepreneurial with lots of new ideas. You know, I wake up every day and my brain is, you know, I have 20 ideas before breakfast and it feels like they're brilliant. <laughs> all of it, I think they're all brilliant, right? That's kind of how I work. That's how I function. And that's what I'm like. So I'm very, like I said, in, opportunity oriented. I see the world is full of opportunities, but despite being entrepreneurial and creative, the problem for me is that I'm too risk blind. So this is an issue for me. This is a big challenge for me. And that's the optimism bias. Now the opposite bias for the pessimism bias refers to people who are more pessimistic about the world. They see the world as more of a hostile place, more of a negative place, uh, full of more threats and opportunities. And they tend to be people who manage threats. They tend to be people who make sure that things are quality. So more quality professionals tend to be pessimistically oriented than optimistically oriented. They're great at stabilizing the situation and improving the situation, but they tend to be too risk averse. Like they tend to be not very creative, not very entrepreneurial because they see the inherent threats of each problem. They don't see as much the opportunities of each problem. So you need both on your team at least two to make good decisions and to function well as a team and collaborate effectively together. Because the optimists are there to create ideas, generate ideas, they're great at generating ideas. Like I said, 20 ideas before breakfast and I think they're all brilliant. And I really like working with other optimists. You know, I run a small consulting uh, and training company, coaching training company called Disaster Avoidance Experts, which as Steve mentioned, make addresses future proofing, cognitive bias, risk management. So that's what we do. And it's very tempting for me to hire only other optimists into my company. It feels very good for me to work with them. I click with them really well. And imagine, but the problem is if I hired only other optimists, if I went with what my gut told me to do, work with other optimists, here's what would happen, you know. Well, it's a six people company, so I have 20 ideas before breakfast. Other people have 20 ideas before breakfast. We have 120 ideas before breakfast. And then we'd be reinforcing each other's ideas <coughs> because I feel that ideas have opportunities. And so I feel that, great, yes, go ahead. It sounds like a great idea, pursue that. And then we'd be running in 120 different directions. And that's just no good. That's, there's a reason about 
half of all startups fail and three quarter within the first five years and three quarters fail within the first 15 years. And that's because one of the major reasons is you run out of cash because you're not pursuing the right projects. You're scattering your resources into many different directions. And the same, of course, applies to large companies and projects that they're doing. So you want people, I make sure to hire people on my team who are pessimists, at least two people, so that they can reinforce each other and support each other. And pessimists are great at seeing those 20 ideas. I give them these 20 ideas and they say, well, these are all half-baked potatoes, but maybe these three are worth finishing baking. And so they make sure to address the problems, improve the quality of these ideas and implement them. They're great at improving things, managing threats, stabilizing them and implementing projects and initiatives. So that's the strength of pessimists. And again, you need both on your team to really succeed in a project and have a good organization. And that includes the leadership team as well. So given that, I'd like to ask you to vote on whether you think it would be valuable for you and your team to investigate and address any negative impacts from the optimism bias or the pessimist bias. Would that be valuable for you and your team to investigate and address whether there are some negative impacts from the optimism bias or the pessimism bias? Please go ahead and vote. Okay, I see more than half of you voted already. That's great. So I'll give you five more seconds because lots of you already voted. Make your voice heard. So overwhelmingly, over 95% uh, of you would like to address the optimism bias and the pessimism bias. Great to hear, or the optimism bias, one of those. So that's great to hear, or of course, both. That's great to hear, it, and you'll get tools to do that after the presentation. All right. So let's talk about how we overcome these dangerous judgment errors. How do we overcome cognitive biases? So we're coming to the second part of the presentation of addressing these problems. You need to go against your intuitions. You need to not, not trust your intuitions, not trust your heart, not trust your gut, not trust your emotions. Our intuitions, again, were great for helping humans survive in that early period when they, we were hunter-gatherers in the ancient savanna, but our brains are pretty bad at making decisions in today's complex world, which is global, multipolar, ambivalent, so you want to not trust your intuitions about other people. Now, in the same way, you don't want to trust your intuitions around food because in the savanna environment, of course, we had to eat any sugar that we came across. It was very important for us to be triggered by sugar when we came across apples, bananas, honey, and other sugary things. The ones who survived, thrived, and reproduced were the ones who were triggered by sugar. But in the modern world, that's a bad idea. And imagine you come into the office in the break room, you know, once post COVID or maybe you're in a hybrid model or something, grateful vendor sends over a box of donuts. And, you know, it's very tempting to take half a donut once you pass by an empty box, you know, 12 you know, a dozen box of, box of a dozen donuts. So you take half a donut and then, you know, it's, you kind of don't want to leave half a donut for somebody else. So you take the other half. And you're, then you're triggered by sugar, and then you take a second one, and a third one. Before you know it, half the box is gone. Not that it ever happened to me, right? And this is a thing that happens to people. There's a reason there's an obesity epidemic here in this country. But we, hopefully all or most of you, at least on this call, on this video conference, have figured out how to address within yourself these unhealthy eating habits. So for example, maybe you've, instead of getting triggered by the donuts, you pass by them and go for a bowl of fruit that another grateful vendor has sent over. Much healthier, much less triggering. And so you figured out for yourself some ways of managing those physical habits but for your physical fitness, the needs of your physical fitness, your diet, your exercise, and so on. In the same way, you need to manage your mental fitness. Make sure that you don't fall into the savanna patterns in making judgments around people, just like you don't fall into the savanna patterns in making judgments around eating. So take care of your physical fitness and take care of your mental fitness by learning about and addressing unconscious bias. And to do so, you need to develop your emotional intelligence, and social intelligence, emotional intelligence, and social intelligence. Now, emotional intelligence 
has to do with yourself. Those are things that have, that have to do with your awareness and your ability to manage your own emotions. So in order to address unconscious bias within yourself, you need to notice when you might be having the horns effect or the halo effect toward other people, or when you, let's say you're pessimistically oriented, when you might be unfairly judging optimistically oriented people as to you know, shooting from the hip, let's say that, and seeing them as having too many half-baked ideas. Now, they might be having too many half-baked ideas, but they don't realize what's going on. And there's value in those half-baked ideas that you might not be feeling that there's value in it. And the same thing for optimists who see pessimists as being Mr. No or Mrs. No and not seeing the value of improving the ideas that pessimists bring and addressing the problematic ideas that optimists bring. So you need to be aware of your emotions and be able to manage them. Now, in order to address unconscious bias, you also need to do the same thing toward other people. So one is within yourself and one is toward other people. And that's what social intelligence is about. It's about being aware and being able to manage, influence other people's emotions and their relationships with each other and to you. The other people's emotions determine their decision-making and your de emotions determine your decision-making. When we just go ahead and let our emotions go with how we feel, our gut intuitions, our reactions, our emotions determine about 80 to 90% of our decisions around other people and related topics. So you want to not allow that to happen and you want, that's emotional intelligence, and you want to realize that it's happening with other people and be able to steer them away from that direction. One way to steer them away from that direction is for you to develop, again, your own emotional intelligence and your social intelligence. And they want to see whether you think it will be valuable for you and your team to develop further your own emotional intelligence and your social intelligence. Would this be of value to you and your team? Please go ahead and vote. I see that two thirds of you voted, so I'll give you five more seconds for those who haven't yet voted. All right, so this is something that's of everyone would find value in developing your own emotional intelligence and social intelligence further. Excellent, great to hear it. So we'll talk about some ways of doing that and I'll send you some materials after the presentation and doing that if you want those materials. Now, one way of developing your emotional intelligence and social intelligence and gaining more awareness of these cognitive biases is an assessment on dangerous judgment errors in the workplace. Now, when you look at cognitive biases, the list of cognitive biases, there are over a hundred of them. You can take a look at the list of cognitive biases in Wikipedia. Not all of them are, are applicable to professional settings. So there's a list of 30 that are the most dangerous for professional settings, which have gathered together into an assessment, which you can use to assess your workplace, yourself, other people, your team, your department, whatever you're focusing on. So it evaluates the extent and the impact of the cognitive biases in your workplace and provides you the next steps for addressing them. I'll give you one example from the assessment. So I'll share my screen and you'll be able to see the assessment. I want you to bring up please your chat because we'll be using the chat function right now. So you see this assessment, so make sure to bring up the chat. And the assessment is just about the assessment, the direction. So this is crucial. You don't need to know about cognitive biases. You don't need to know anything about cognitive biases to take the assessment. They're about, the assessment is about behaviors, observable, clear behaviors. So your goal is to indicate how often each of the problems described below occurred in your organization over the past year as a percentage of all the times that it could have occurred. So that's, you know, you don't really want to overthink it. Go with your initial impression. So each question should take 10, 15, 20 seconds or so. So let's go with question six. When a potential or current employee was evaluated, in what percentage of the situations was the evaluation too positive due to factors not relevant to their job competency or organizational fit? Please answer in the chat. 
how what is the percentage when an eval uh, when an employee was evaluated too positively? Greg says seventy five percent, Vanessa seventy five percent, Steve says twenty percent, Tanya says eighty percent, Frank and Sandra say seventy percent, Mauricio. 50%, Phil, 70%. So we see pretty high numbers. So Steve was the lowest at 20%. And there's lots of uh, 70, 50%. When it's in the 10 to 20% range, it's not too bad. It you know, happens occasionally. Not something to focus on a lot of effort. When it gets on, goes into the 20 to 30% range, it becomes more problematic because you're not evaluating employees effectively, not promoting them well. If it goes above the 30% range, it becomes a serious problem. I see a number of you have it in the 50, 70, 80% range. That's a serious problem because that creates a lot of unfairness, a lot of disjunction. A lot of people perceive that the situation is not good and that creates this engagement, harms retention, harms employment. So you don't want that. And so there are many other questions, 29 other questions that also get at problematic behaviors. So you want to be aware that this is what the assessment is about and you'll be able to take this, I'll send you the assessment after the presentation if you want it. You'll be able to take it yourself and bring it to your team. Now, let's see, using the poll, I'm curious to know how much value you think it would be for your team to take the assessment on dangerous judgment errors and address the cognitive biases it uncovers, one or more of the over of the 30 cognitive biases it uncovers. Would it be valuable for you to do that? Please go ahead and vote. See, we have over half of the people voting. Let's give folks five more seconds, make their voice heard. Great. Okay, so we see that 90% of you, so nine tenths would find it valuable. Great to hear it. What you'll want to do, given you find valuable, is that you'll want to take it yourself after you get it, and I'll email it to you. And after you take it yourself, you'll want to bring it to your team and say, hey, I took this, here's the value that I see in it. And I think the team should take it and address the cognitive biases it uncovers. And let's talk about, so that's about awareness. How do you address these once you're aware of it? A really good technique, a very quick one and a very effective one for making better decisions around people is the five questions to avoid decision disasters. This is a technique for making good enough decisions. The large majority of your decisions around people are just about good enough decisions. You know, who do you want to include in your team? Who do you want to meet with? Who do you want uh, to be in the project with you? Maybe things like what kind of email do you want to write to someone that's important and how do you not screw that up or communication, right? Communication, collaboration, all of that sort of stuff. How do you improve a process? These are the kinds of questions that you want to address and make sure to get right enough, good enough. You don't need to get these this perfect, you know. If you want to get this perfect, this is not the best technique because this, you know, this is a technique that only takes a couple of minutes to use. And if you want to get something perfect, like making a major hire, there are other techniques that I'll send to you after the presentation that you can use. But this is about good enough decisions, which you can use five to 10 times a day because it's a very quick technique just takes a couple of minutes. So five questions to use to avoid decision disasters and make good enough decisions. First, Ask yourself, what important information didn't I yet fully consider? So what evidence didn't you take into account? That's what this is about. Fully consider is a crucial component of it. We tend to not consider information that goes against our intuitions, that goes against our beliefs, that goes against what we feel is the right thing. So you want to make sure to go against your intuitions and value that information about who to work with, how, what kind of email to send, message to send, and so on more than the kind of information that goes with to your intuitions. Next, what dangerous judgment errors have I yet addressed? We're talking about the halo effect and the horns effect, the optimism bias and the pessimism bias. The assessment talks about the 26 more other cognitive biases that are really important for addressing good decision-making and making sure that you don't have unconscious bias. 
What would a trusted objective advisor suggest I do? So think about that angel on your shoulder. What would they suggest you do? Maybe somebody who is a peer member of ASQ, Greater Palm Beach or South Florida, someone, maybe a member of the board and experienced someone, someone who's a maybe have a coach or consultant or a peer mentor within your organization, someone who you trust, what would they suggest you do? Next, how have I addressed all the ways this could fail? So think about if when you're improving a process that you're working with people, how, or when you're sending an email to someone, how have you addressed all the ways this might fail? And finally, what new information will cause you to revisit this decision? When we make a decision, we're very tempted to stick with it. We're invested into it, and it's called post-factum rationalization. We rationalize our rightness after the decision. But if we make a decision, when we're making a decision, if we say, okay, this information about, let's say, a new hire would cause me to change my mind about this new hire or about the you know, sending an email to someone and their response to it or something like that, then that would enable you to make much better decisions about people going forward. So these are the five questions that you want to use on any decision around people that you don't want to screw up, that you want to make good enough decisions. Now, let's go to the poll again. And I want to ask you, similar to the previous one, do you think it would be valuable for you and your team to use the five questions technique to avoid making bad decisions? In those cases where good enough is really good enough. So please go ahead and vote. All right. So I see just over half of you voted. I'll give you five more seconds. Make your voice heard. All right, so we see that over nine tenths of you would like to use this technique. That's great. I'll send you a decision aid on it for those who want it, of course. And so, again, try using this yourself. But the decision aid is great. You can print it out, put it by your computer screen. It's very helpful because, you know, we spend so much time by our computer nowadays working from home. And even when you're coming into the office, you'll want it by your computer. So just, you know, have one copy. If you have hybrid workforce, one copy at home, one copy at your workplace. And then, of course, send it out to your team, tell them about it, say this is a technique that you think would be helpful for folks to use, and start them on using it. All right. And finally, last but not least, I mentioned that I'll be sending free resources to those who want them. So let's talk about that, free additional resources from the presentation. The assessment and dangerous judgment errors in the workplace, the whole assessment with all 30 questions and how to address, what next steps to take based on it. Then decision aid on the five key questions to avoid decision disasters, which I mentioned. Then the simple chapters from my best-selling book, which uh, Steve already talked about, The Blind Spots Between Us, How to Overcome Unconscious Cognitive Bias and Deal Better Relationships. And finally, I'll be happy to give a coaching session to folks who want a coaching session on integrating this information into their work, into their everyday activities in the workplace. I have three open slots and it's first come first serve. So I'll send an email after the presentation with a link to schedule a coaching session. If the link still works for you when you schedule it, that means one of the three slot, that means that you're getting one of the free slots available. If the link doesn't work, that means all the free slots are taken. So I'll send that in a couple in within a couple of hours after the end of the presentation. So you'll be able to claim your slot if you want it. Okay, and we have the same process using the following. Do you think you would like to get the key post training resources from me after the presentation? So please go ahead and vote. And while you're voting, I'll be happy to take any questions that you have. Let's see. Uh, in the meantime, looking at cognitive biases, uh, looking at questions, Tamara asked, is it possible to have one bias for one aspect in your life and the other for another? Not really for the optimism and pessimism bias, I assume you mean. For the optimism and pessimism bias, we tend to be pretty the same. We tend to see the world as either more full of opportunities or more full of threats on average. Now, if we had a challenging experience in one area of our life or the other, that can vary but not if we didn't have a specific challenging experience that caused us to be different. And again, this is not you know, an absolute 
this is a spectrum. So some folks are right in the middle who are you know, perfectly aligned, make the perfect decisions. It's very rare. Some are moderately optimistic, moderately pessimistic. Some are highly optimistic and highly pessimistic. I tend to be highly optimistic, which is a problem for me. Uh, Marco says it's very important to recognize that yes, men and women are brown nose or yes, they definitely tend to go up the ladder quicker. And that's a big problem because they feed into the halo effect and folks don't realize they have that unconscious bias toward them. Glenn, okay. I have a question if I, uh, yes. if I may. Of course. I'm Phil, St. Tony up here. Hi, um, hi. say, I, um, are you familiar with the, uh, the personality type instruments like Myers-Briggs and some of That's the right. others, how do they fit in? How do, how do the, uh, is there any correlation between any of the biases, uh, you know, and, and, and personality type? Sure, of course. Yeah, some of the people you know, in the personality types, for example, people who are extroverted. So you think of extroversion, introversion. People who are extroverted tend to be more optimistic. They tend to be more open. They tend to be more optimistic. People who are introverted tend to be more pessimistic. Uh, same thing, uh, so that's, a, that's an example. The same thing goes with people who are more open to experiences. People who are more open to experiences, that's in the big five survey, tend to be more, more optimistic. People who are less open to experiences tend to be more pessimistic. And th th so there is correlation to the personality types. But personality types are not the same thing as cognitive biases. We all, you know, everyone who is introverted tends to suffer from some measure of overconfidence, for example. They are overconfident in their extroversion. People who are introverted tend to be overconfident in their introversion. So that's kind of a, the way the dynamic works. Other Thanks. folks? Thank you. Sure. I, I have a question. Um, yeah. As I'm thinking about this uh, subject and the bias, I, uh, what comes to mind for me because it's been so prevalent lately, is related to politics. Mm -hmm. uh, so people, I think people can, you know, it's normal for someone to have a bias. They're either Republican or Democrat. Sure. Okay. But what what do you make or have you, have you thought about and have any insight as to a particular bias, which is what's grown in the past year or so people just shutting everything out and having mm. a particular bias, uh, what I call Trumpism, uh, stuck and, and don't wanna, don't, they, they actually don't believe or you know, it's driving conspiracies, et cetera. Have you heard of or studied this or do you have thoughts yes. on it? Yeah, I studied this and it has to do with polarization. So it's not simply about Trump. It's so also there are people on the left who get more polarized as well. The more polarized we are, the more biased we are. And polarization, if you look at the research on polarization, American politics has become much more polarized over the last couple of decades with the rise of social media. So social media has driven very strong polarization on both sides of the aisle in American politics. You'll see that people's opinions were much closer together about two decades ago, and they have shifted far, farther and further apart with the growth of the internet and especially social media. So that's a big problem. And people have more horns effect toward each other. <laughs> I mean, Republicans have more horns effect toward Democrats. Democrats have more horns effect toward Republicans than they used to have. And so that's kind of, and people are more stuck in their position. And that's just due to the information landscape that we're in, unfortunately. Hmm. Wow. Okay, interesting. Other folks? Well, it seems there may not be other questions. Let me see. Give five more seconds to folks if anybody has a question. You can either chat or unmute yourself. Yeah, oh, it's, Frank interesting. Has a it's interesting with the horns effect. The politics is a great example because, you, like you mentioned, uh, manufacturing uh, operations and quality, and, and that's been around for decades, you know, <laughs> trying to push product versus make sure it's right. Yep. Uh, you see in politics, what, what would be the, I mean, obviously, what would you do, you know, to reverse this trend? 
because mm -hmm. obviously you just look at the horn effect or the halo effect. I mean, that seems to be key uh, in all aspects of our lives right now. If you really open it up and look at different things, you know. Absolutely, Frank. And actually, the same thing works when I could consult with companies and addressing quality operation, quality versus operations. And when you look at what works, when your research shows what works in addressing political issues, what works in both cases is drawing attention away from what divides us and drawing attention toward what unites us. So, for example, with a company, what unites us is wanting to make sure that we make profit in the long term, right? Kind of the quality is ensures that the product is high quality. And if people in product are very tempted to cut corners, it's natural that you're tempted to cut corners because you want to produce more and more, and that's what they're paid for. That's their incentive. But in the long run, if the product is worse quality, then you'll have less customers. And you know, no matter how much product is manufactured, they won't buy it. <laughs> so that's bad for the company. So the same thing. You know, goes from a political perspective. When you draw attention toward what we share, for example, all Democrats and Republicans in general want America to be a peaceful and prosperous country. We want, you know, generally infrastructure, maybe we're not, we don't fully agree on what infrastructure is, but at least roads and bridges are generally accepted as things that we agree on. So those things that you agree on in the same way within a company or within a body politics, when you draw attention to that and when you focus on that, that's how you bridge the halo effect and the horns effect. Uh, I have one, one comment in regards to this situation. Uh, quality shouldn't get involved with uh, politics and with cost because depending on now, I am in the aerospace industry. See mm -hmm. what happened with Boeing. Mm -hmm. Three yep. or four accidents, how many people die? Yep. What about is that is that is that plane crashing to a city? A lot of more people. So that is a problem. I mean, you cannot cut corners. Like for example, in medical device, aerospace specifically, you cannot cut corners. Yep. Because it's gonna be very fatalistic and the long run, you're gonna the company like Boeing is about to be bankrupt. Yes. And many people have been probably indicted for criminal offenses. So and people don't understand that, that they want to make the billing of the week. And they want to pass everything as much as possible. In the aerospace industry, every part that is rejected have a second opportunity to be back into the into the into the system, into, into the stream by MRB. Some other some material review board, which goes to be reviewed again, what they can do about that. What to skip if you have a procedure to do it. I guess in, yep. in, in the medical device also you have that type of uh, of uh, similar similar to MRV to make a decision based sure. on whether it's good or not. So you shouldn't be cutting corners because it's, it's very costly when life involved and all the stuff, you know. Thank you. Oh, you're, you're absolutely right. And here we have an example in Boeing where the tribe of production overcame the tribe of quality and where the tribe of quality was really underemphasized by the top leadership. When you see what the top leadership was doing, there was plenty of information. I mean, they had email from quality professionals who were testing from pilots and so on, who were testing the new 737 MAX emails. And I'm quoting from and congressional testimony. Completely. Congressional testimony, these planes were you know, made by monkeys, supervised by clowns, <laughs> you know, designed by monkeys, supervised by clowns. And that is an example of information to the top leadership that quality was compromised. But the top leadership chose to emphasize production at the expense of quality, and that's what happens. And that's kind of something that I've definitely talked to companies about, whether, again, from production manufacturing, actual physical products or software, you have a lot of software problems coming because you're cutting corners too. So it happens in all areas. Now I wanna make sure to get to Vanessa's question. She asks, how can this information help with recruitment and interview sessions? What you want to make sure to do with recruitment and interview is to check for whether you have feelings of halo effect or horns effect toward other people who you're interviewing. So halo effect or horns effect. And you want to inform other people who are doing recruitment and interviewing about their own potential feelings of halo effect and horns effect. 
And if you're feeling more halo effect, a halo toward that person, you want to decrease your internal evaluation and your scoring of that person. And you're feeling more of a horns effect, you want to increase your internal evaluation and scoring of those other people. So that's the, what that's what is a good practice for recruitment. Let's see. And Vanessa also asks, when a group team learns about these biases, how likely is an individual able to shift or change the way they make decisions? Is it realistic to make change? Oh yeah, it's absolutely realistic to make change. We have extensive research showing that information and training on cognitive biases addresses these problems. So when you people, a, a usual way to start the intervention is to have people take the assessment and then take talk about these problems. I mean, it's shocking to see positive, overly positive evaluations of 50% or more. I mean, that's kind of really, really problematic for a company to have these positive. I mean, what's the point of these evaluations if you have of over 50% or more of them are positive, right? That's a big, big, huge problem in a company. And when that information is brought to the leadership, HR, to teams, that's something that drives and motivates change. So the assessment is a crucial tool. And then the next step is using these tools like the decision-making technique to make better decisions about people, whether in the, your evaluation or promotion, whether in your interviews or so on. So yes, this is something that definitely happens and the average intervention, effective intervention takes uh, changes this dynamic by about 20 percentage points. That's the average intervention change. So an effective intervention change results in about a 20% shift in these points. So if you imagine how good it would be if the number goes down from 50% to 30% of these evaluations are going to you know, be worse. So that's, that's something that you wanna be thinking about. All right, so I think we're a little bit over time now. So I think got all the questions answered. And yeah. to those who voted, I will send you the information after the presentation. Very good. Well, thank you. That was an excellent presentation, Dr. Lev. I re really appreciate that. I hope everyone welcome, uh, enjoyed it. It looks like you held their attention because I think that the group that we started with is the same group that's still here an hour excellent. later. <laughs> so we did uh, we did very well. I found it fascinating. Uh, so I look forward to receiving the information. Mm -hmm. We'll send. Okay. Thanks everybody for participation and uh, and joining us tonight. And have a good rest of the week. Thank you. Bye bye Thank you. everyone. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you for all the good words. Bye. Bye bye. Yeah, and uh, Dr. Gleb, if you can, yes. and I. I was not able to participate in the polling because I, I think you made me a co-host. That's right. Somehow it didn't let me click on anything. But um, if you can, send me the information anyway mm -hmm. my, to my email. I appreciate it. Will do. Okay. okay. Take care. Have a good night. Bye-bye.